Um, so uh, here we are. This is part of the Clown Congress, the first Clown Congress um, we've organised. Um, we are uh, here in Bristol in, in the UK in person uh, for four days, um, exploring and debating and discussing um, and challenging ourselves on, on issues, um, uh, broadly speaking, on social justice. Um, uh, yesterday, we dedicated ourselves to politics and power and protest today to issues of decolonization and anti-racism and tomorrow on climate and the planet. And then we have a fourth day, which is open as yet. So today's panel um, slots into the decolonization and um, anti-racism debate. Um, I'm very glad to welcome two panelists and moderator um, all from North America and in North America, which for me and for us here in the UK and Europe um, will perhaps bring a different perspective on some of the debates we've been having this week. So I'll just hand over to Amrita, who's going to moderate the session. Uh, thank you, John. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm also going to just repeat some of the Zoom things for folks that are just joining. Um, you're welcome to mute and you're welcome to also be off video if you like. And then you can also left click or right click and hide all the video participants. So you're just seeing um, the panelists, if you like, there's no formality to do that. Um, and then also I do encourage you all when we go into discussion to come back online, if you'd like, and to unmute yourself. In life, there's always random noises. So I love the idea of unmuted random noises when we come into conversation. Um, so I just wanna begin by thanking everyone for joining us. Um, I am here in uh, North America. So I'm going to be starting with a land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge, or I acknowledge, the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which I am gathered here in Los Angeles, the Tongva, the Chumash, and the Gabrielino, and their elders past, present, and emerging. And as um, we all gather in this connected community online, we also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land outside of Los Angeles. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be First Nations land. Um, I further recognize the past atrocities against the first peoples of this land and that America, the United States of America, was founded on the genocide and dispossession of First Nations people. I acknowledge that colonial structures and policies remain in place today and recognize the ongoing struggles of First Nations people in dismantling those, those structures. The struggle to seek justice, to, dis, to remember and address this nation's past is ongoing and is a necessary requirement for individual and collective healing process. Um, letting this person in. And I further recognize that as a settler, saying these words is not enough, it's just a beginning, and that my words call me into action to support Indigenous-led grassroots movements, um, change movements, and campaigns, as well as a commitment to returning land. Um, and here on Tongva land, where I am, there's a lot of ways to get involved with local organizations and communities, and I encourage folks to do the same wherever you are. Okay. Um, and if you're not familiar, that was a land acknowledgement and anyone is welcome to make it their own and to use it. Um, these are not things that just belong to one person. Um, okay. Uh, hello, Mr. Quinn, I think. Um, oh, yes. we're just getting started. Um, you're yeah. welcome to unmute. And also, if you'd like, you can take yourself off video and then you can hide the other non-video participants. You can just view the panelists if you'd like, or you can stay on video, however you would prefer. Um, okay, so I'd like to welcome our uh, two guests here, um, Jacqueline Russell and Barry Belinsky. I'm gonna pass it over to them to introduce themselves and to also share a little bit about the type of work that they do. So I'll go to my left. Jacqueline, you're to my left. Hi, my name is Jacqueline. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I am speaking to you today from uh, Treaty 7 territory in Canada, which is uh, Mokinstis, or uh, commonly known as Calgary. This is the uh, land of the Nusotapi nations of the Siksika, Pakani, and Gainai, the Tsutsina nation, and the Nakoda nations of Wesley, Bearspaw, and Chimiki. Um, part of the land acknowledgement I like to give is also to include the fact that storytelling has been part of the tradition and practice of this place since time immemorial, and the practice that we call clown is an ancient practice that has been part of the land for much longer than the white people who write about it have um, described. 
Uh, yeah, I first came into clown when I was in my last year of university. I was in a very classical actor style conservatory training program. I was pretty unhappy in it. Um, and then I discovered clown and was like, ah, maybe this is a place for me. Uh, since then, I've done a lot of different types of clown training, uh, I've done some teaching, and I'm currently working on a couple of different shows, uh, one about abortion and reproductive rights using clown um, as a tool and a lens to um, find a way to make a joyful, um, pleasure-centered show about um, reproductive justice. And I'm also, and that's with my collaborator, Aaron Pettifor. Um, and I'm also currently creating and developing a show that looks at chronic illness and invisible illnesses um, and using clown as a way to, yeah, tell stories that can tread into the territory of victimhood and using clown as a strategy to subvert that uh, storytelling. And I recently did a, a master's degree um, where my thesis looked at feminist clowning and uh, strategic possibilities of the intersection of feminist theory and clown ways of knowing. And in that process, I began to unpack the history of clown and <laughs> realize how white and cis and het um, it is and how we are lacking in things that are written about it that um, can help uh, undo some of those narratives. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. I, I could talk about clown forever. So I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Lovely. Um, Barry? My name is Barry. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I am Cree, Métis, and Ukrainian descent uh, from Treaty 6 territory. <clears throat> I'm currently in Chochoge, though, which is uh, Haudenosaunee territory. Um, which is the city of Montreal. And yeah, I primarily work as a director. I uh, had a clown company for a hot second and have been doing some film and animation. I, I studied in pachinko style clowning and continued to rove and create shows where I developed my uh, duo with my Cantonese Canadian counterpart, Bill Yong. Um, we did several projects and we're working on another one, really looking at ancestry, connection to territory, connection to our lineage and uh, how you can kind of play within that in our own sort of mythology and storytelling. I work predominantly in indigenous theater across Canada, <clears throat> indigenous theater and film. Um, that started back in about 2014 when I was brought onto a project, um, or, um, a must be Muskegee Musqua Esquail, uh, where we toured across the prairies. And it really showed me that there was a, a distinct and unique perspective coming from indigenous artists um, that wasn't reflected in the institutions that I was trained in. And I got hooked and I went full bore on that. And a lot of my work now is about finding ways to bring elements of the practice that I was trained in into this new focus that I have um, been working on for about however long it is, seven years. Um, yeah. Did you say a book that you've been working on for the last seven years? No, I said something else, but I can't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I just moved forward in time. I can't remember what I said two sentences ago. Fair enough. And actually the past doesn't exist, so. Right. No, it's what you lies. Said. It's all lies. lies. All lies. Um, well, thank you for those introductions. I also realized I didn't say my pronouns. I'm she, her, Amrita. And um, I'm really grateful to be facilitating this conversation. And we don't have a lot of time. So if it's okay, I'm going to just dive right in. Um, so I want to start by, um, I'm also really grateful. I just want to say to be gathering folks and we don't often get to talk about clown in this and through this lens and so much of clown is to like to play and have fun and the interrogation of like how do I get better at this and um so a lot of people by nature are like not willing to have these more difficult or um uncomfortable conversations so as we're speaking you might feel discomfort coming up 
Um, you might be reminded of things and way that you've participated. This is for the people listening and that perhaps you've been in systems in which there have been um, harmful things happening and you're aware of how you are complicit. So I welcome you to hold that to, um, and to take notes as we're going along and to also add your questions into the chat, but to stay with us. And as we talk about um, clowning and, um, and equity and social justice. Also, that, these are very big talk of it topics and we're gonna have a brief amount of time together. So to just ground us all and to realizing that we are gonna cover some areas, um, some we might get very specific into, some it might stay a bit broad um, and to just welcome us to hold, like what is the conversation that is possible today with the people that have gathered here right now? And um, it might not feel like a nice tied up bow at the end and that's okay. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna dive in. Um, the first thing I'd like to kind of look at is the role of the audience. And I'm gonna read um, actually a quote from an interview that Jacqueline was in um, that was done by Jennifer Roberts uh, for the Art Commons. It looks like it was a blog. And Jacqueline, how recently was this done? Gosh, time has lost all meaning. I wanna say five years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is a perspective that I've heard a lot of people say in clowning. So I'm going to read the quote. You can't live in clown. Well, I'm sorry. You can't lie in clown. Well, I mean, you can, but the audience will know and they will not find you funny. They will not even find you sad. They will simply not connect with you if you lie. So for me, this really gets into the identity of the performer on stage and the various identities. And how do we as a population of people, as a society, decide who is trustworthy? Who do we believe in? And so my question for Jacqueline and Barry is what is the role of the audience? Um, an art form that is in reaction, clowning is an art form that's in reaction to the audience. What change or what is the role of change and justice with a predominantly white audience? Yeah. So, um... I was kind of weighed into it with a weird experience that I had. Um, Bill and I, we did a, a, a turn at this event at a place called the White Space, which was kind of funny. And um, it was essentially like this real hip kind of spoken word, that kind of thing. Um, and we decided to bring a clown act in. So we're red leather, yellow leather, kind of leaning into the indigenous and Chinese uh, thing. And we had a bit where he came in in a, Chicago Blackhawks jersey, it's like a big emblem on it. And we made a teepee out of hockey sticks and we had a headdress on a, on a, like up there with a camera. And the whole bit was getting people to come up with headdress on and take their photo. Like that's, that was the idea. Um, we knew that it was going to go a certain way and it went exactly there. The, the audience hated us from the minute that we started. Um, there was like moving in the seats, telling us, telling us off. Uh, I came in and diffused the situation and sort of like politely admonished him for doing it. And everyone had a sigh of relief and that was it. It wasn't a good turn, but it was an interesting experiment because there was maybe four people of color, two indigenous and two others in the room. And they came up to us afterwards, like quietly, like that was the best thing I've ever seen. Um, but if anyone took a look at that room, it was a bomb, like it bombed so hard. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I just thought that that's a story <laughs> in relation to <laughs> what, what this is like. I mean, um, I'm as much as possible. I, I've been working more in indigenous, uh, circles and centering indigenous audiences, which is very awesome in Edmonton or across the prairies where you do have a large, um, indigenous percentage of the people. Um, but often I will get hit with like, oh, well, this has be, this has to be for everyone, or this can't just be for Native folks. And there's always this way of silencing how Indigenous people are supposed to be centered in this work. Um, and that it's supposed to be for a more general audience. And general typically means uh, non-Indigenous and usually not, or and usually like white. Um, so trying to navigate that because, you know, as a clown, you want to kind of engage with everyone. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, unless you're looking at being a producer and really focusing your content to bring in diverse audiences, um, a lot of it is just which situations you want to put yourself in. I found myself pull out of doing cabarets um, that aren't centered around like indigenous festivals or anything like that, um, just because they stop feeling safe after a while, I feel quite tokenized and and then worse, you feel like you're leaning into some of the tokenism and making fun of elements of yourself, which is, you know, part of the process. Um, but you can never quite tell if people are laughing at you or if they're laughing at, if, they, if you think that they, or if they think they're in on a joke that is inappropriate or, or what, and it becomes really complicated pretty fast. Yeah, and you're saying this about when you say a part of the process, are you saying that about the clown process of finding your, developing your, unique sense of ridiculousness yeah exactly um you know the things that I mock in myself or the things that I find funny about myself are sometimes drawn from my traumatic upbringing and that sometimes is connected to the history of genocide in Canada so it can be a bit of a tricky thing to diffuse the personal bomb uh in that way and have it feel safe without being able to give it a bunch of context and that at that point it starts to feel like, well, if I have to give a, a lecture before I clown, maybe yeah. I shouldn't be clowning, maybe I should be lecturing. I'm hearing you name like the medium that we play in, it changes. Um, and questioning like, is clown the medium? Um, because it seems limited when we think about the role of the audience and in, in, in also playing a significant role. Um, you know, it's not an art gallery where we just go and observe the final product. It is a live thing. Um. It's really interesting too, Barry, this notion of like the universality expectation that um, something is successfully funny if everyone in the room finds it funny um, versus if much of the room is confused by it. <laughs> and a few people find it really funny. Um, mm -hmm. I remember um, you and your clown partner performed a show at the Edmonton Fringe um, and there were some reviews that really didn't understand what was the intention of the show and had a really racist perspective on it because there was this expectation that like, I as the white reviewer didn't find it that funny, therefore it was not funny. Um, and so I think this plays out in in how we review or you know critically speak about clown as well. Um, much of what I've read in academic circles or when you're looking for reviews of clown shows online, the reviewers go in with this expectation that I have had to personally have a great time and laugh a lot for it to be legitimately good clown. Um, and so yeah, it becomes this really interesting question of like how do we define clown and how do we define good or successful or um, quality um, clowning. Um, and I've had people outright say to me like, um, you know, thinking about anti-oppression approaches in clown isn't what clown is. Um, that's just not clown. Clown's supposed to be just pure joy, just pure fun. Everybody in the room should be having fun. We just want fun, fun, fun all the time. <laughs> and like, it must be nice to, to, have your life live in such a way with that much privilege that you have only ever had fun experiences of clown. Um, Jacqueline, yeah. where do you think that, that, that comes from, that clown? Because I, I mean, I've heard it before. Barry, have you heard that before? That clown is pure joy, pure delight. Where could you name where you think that comes from? Privilege? I think... Other and, and, a, and a, an approach to clown that has been cultivated over the years that has really gone. We love the magical mysticism that we find in indigenous approaches. And we love the, you know, hand-picked um, romanticized things that we find in other cultures that are um, doing really interesting things with clown. And we're going to mash that all together into an approach that makes us feel good and clown is magical and it is mystical and it is all of those things but um, there's been a lack of accountability of how those uh, pedagogies have come to be played out and in that lack of accountability 
because we haven't been honest, <laughs> right? That's the common rule, be honest. We haven't been honest about how these things came to be. You know, I can't speak to all clown traditions, but like in Canada specifically, we have some really rich traditions of clown here and we have not been honest about how they came to be. And so as a result, there's this sort of um, lie of like clown is just magic. It's just love and magic um, without an underpinning of responsibility, justice, equity, all those things. Yeah. I've, I've often thought that part of the reason why clown has to be so joyful and buoyant is because a lot of like European pedagogy is in a binary. So there's the other side, that's the dark side. So you have like, even the idea of drama versus comedy. Like I've seen plenty of dramas that make me laugh and plenty of comedies that can, you know, bring a tear. So just this idea of constantly splitting. Um, I wanna go back to also that how we review and critically speak about clown. Um, there was actually a Canadian uh, artist, I'm sure you all have heard about this, but Yolanda Bonnell, um, that she asked that the reviewers in the press release when she was it was sent out that the that it only um, that only people of color review it, and it created such an uproar that like multiple news sources covered the fact of the request versus actually reviewing the show, <laughs> and I thought that that really speaks to like just how difficult it is to disrupt this idea of um, the please spell the names yes. Will do. Um, of um, how much the audience really has such a a hold on what the, what clown can be, um, and this idea to pivot out of it also means having reviewers that are going to be conscious of the various identities on stage. And the artist's name is Yolanda Bonal, and um, the play that sh that they did was called Bug. And you can look and I up the drop the really... news article in there as well. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jacqueline, did you have a, any additional thoughts about, in particular, about your experience with the role of the audience? And I mean, you are playing with some pretty um, juicy stuff here from abortion to. Yeah. I mean, we had some walkouts for that show for sure. No, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but. Uh... Yeah, I think it's uh, what's been really empowering for me um, has been to recognize that clown is just made up and so we can make it whatever we want, right? Um, and so I think part of what's interesting to me as a clown is, yeah, being in conversation with the audience and trying to find that balance as you spoke to Barry of like, how do you um, educate them or invite them in really strategic ways into a different way of seeing or a different way of um, expectation. And when you just go, you know what, I'm not interested in performing for these audiences or it doesn't matter to me if this work resonates with the universal neutral audience. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, something I'm just centering on is like, a lot of this is about clown in, in performance and typically for a general audience. Um, I have seen, I mean, most of the people that have been so eager to learn clown have been young indigenous performers that just like love it and want to do it in their own circles and their own spheres. And there's like, there's a, a huge amount of, um, of excitement to some of the tenants of clown that people find very interesting. Um, and it feels like it just hits a wall as soon as we get to that bubble of like, okay, well, yes, but how do you make it? How do you make something that's palatable to enough people to warrant calling yourself an artist? How do you make it not just a niche thing that you do in private, but that's actually, you know, part of a, of a global conversation. And that's when it runs into the, the audience being, you know, uh, like the reviewers, I'm sure their their responses, the, the basis, like the, the most of our people that we're representing are going to come in with my lens. So why would I try and only have the lens of people that are going to love the show if I'm trying to represent 100, 200,000 people like me, right? So then it becomes conversations about um, access and and diversity and across the entire 
country, which is way too daunting for me. I have no interest in that. <laughs> yes, you're getting into another, um, that's a great transition into like, like what is the, the, what is the weight that you carry as an artist in clowning focused on social justice and equity? Um, I'd like to read actually a quote from um, Kathy Park Hong's book, Minor Feelings. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna read actually a beginning um, quote of hers and she talks about reading news stories and then getting into the particular um, focus on having to tell identity led anything, clown, identity led storytelling, identity led plays, etc. cetera. So um, this is the first part. Kathy Hong writes, I sometimes avoid reading a news story when a victim is Asian because I don't want to pay attention to the fact that no one else is paying attention. I don't want to care that no one else cares because I don't want to be left stranded in my rage. Um, and for me, that's really like this, th that's a, 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 I acknowledge too that I'm here in California and the United States. And so um, this, the invisibility of identity and um, yeah, the, the real pain you see when there are certain things that we, there's a very big collective response to. And if you just change the race of that person or their sexual identity and how little care there is now for that, that same story. So, um, Kathy Hong goes on to further write about this in relation, and Kathy is a, uh, a beautiful poet. Um, and, so she goes on to talk about the, a lot of the book is about her uh, wrestling with this idea of what she's allowed to write and what um, will get her to, Barry, to your point, what you mentioned about when you hit this wall, where can it be resonate for a greater group of people? So our, this is Kathy's words, our humanity and worthiness of storytelling is tied to our identities. We are encouraged to write, so she writes, I am encouraged to write whatever felt true to my heart, but since I was Asian, I might as well stick to the subject of Asians, even though no one cared about Asians. But what choice did I have since if I wrote about say nature, no one would care because I was an Asian person writing about nature. And um, so I'm curious in, in response to hearing these quotes, how, how do you feel, how is your work shaped by this greater ecosystem that we exist in? Um, in particular in relationship to clowning. How does that shape the type of clowning you feel you have to do or that you must do or you feel free to do? Mm -hmm. Good question. So <clears throat> it's, it's uh, so I speak mostly from, it, like, from an indigenous perspective. Um, I don't know. Uh, as someone who's mixed race, um, I have had the opportunity to be like, you know, Barry, why don't you just not do that? Um, just, you know, talk about something else and maybe you could be, you know, put in stereotypical ethnicity that's ethnic passing. Um, but what I realized is that so much of what I've been given and the opportunities, I mean, I'm one of the first people in my family to fully go through university um, a lot of people didn't make it to, through school. Um, there's, don't want to get too much into the, the whole history of Canada and Western Canada and, and what happened, but it's quite phenomenal to even be in a position that I am. And so sometimes when I do get that, like, oh, wouldn't this be easier if I didn't talk about these things? I get hit with everything that I've been given has gotten me to this point. And it really hurts to speak the things that aren't related to it and then have that issue just disappear like if the fight comes up in the room and I don't take it on and then nobody takes it on I just feel like it's a missed opportunity and I'm not doing the right thing it, I don't know how to quite explain it but it's like there just isn't enough representation and there isn't enough allyship to shoulder that conversation in a way that feels adequate for me to feel like I can play in the sandbox and to explore different stories. Um, as far as the expectation, I mean, people are gonna see me the way they see me. So if I did a piece about, you know, playing a recorder with my nose, it's gonna be a Métis guy playing a recorder with his nose. It's, it's just kind of what happened. Um, how much I lean into it or not lean into it 
is a matter of what agency I want to have to direct the conversation. Um, so I, I do feel privileged because I have that ability to do that. I'm not um, in a position where I'm forced to only ever speak to one thing, but I feel obligated to. Yeah, I really appreciate you naming like that there is enough representation or allyship to to shoulder that conversation. So sometimes it is like the, bur it's maybe, and I don't hear you saying burden exactly. I hear you saying like <clears throat> that, I like I have to, like a calling. So to, if this resonates with you, I'm hearing you say like it's an honor or something that you feel called to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jacqueline, what about yourself? Uh, I, when I, the first full length clown show I made, I made with uh, my clown partner, uh, Jed Tomlinson. And I think I was very unaware <laughs> of how um, I wouldn't be able to escape my semiotics on stage, particularly as a female clown. Um, we, you know, made this show and we were out in the world touring it and performing it. And the day that, so Jed was the high status clown. I was the low status clown. We trained in a very traditional Joey Auguste um, relationship style. And so the day that an audience member suggested to Jed that he needed to like slap me around <laughs> to get me in, you know, uh, disciplined. Um, which if you're two white male clowns, you can do to each other and it's funny. Um, but as a female clown and a male clown hitting a female clown, it's not. Was the day I was like, ah, it doesn't really matter what I do on stage. There's certain things about who I am and how I present that are always going to be here. And so I may as well just like lean into that and use it to my advantage, make it part of my comedic strategy. Um, yeah. So... I don't know if it's like a pressure to speak to identity, but more so is going like, well, it's going to be here anyway. So why not use it to my advantage? Um, because there are things I can do as a female clown that somebody else can, couldn't. Um, and so, yeah, it's like knowing where you fit in relation to the power dynamics on stage, off stage, in the audience, I think can be just really useful. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'm hearing you name like that, that it's like what the, and does, this does feel like a bit of the clown ethos of like embracing all parts of ourselves. And I always, I always find that like so liberating, like that general idea of like embrace, embrace our failures, embrace, embrace our flops, like embrace the parts that we don't want others to see. And then I always found it, it funny when we're in like predominantly white clown spaces where like no one will say embrace race or <laughs> sexual identity or, you know, so um, I, I appreciate what you're saying, which is like, it, it's, it's, uh, this is an identity that's always present, you know? Um, so why, so, so why deny it? And then on the flip side of that, I've really enjoyed like taking some courses with Deanna Flesher and doing like drag clown type things. And like leaning into the opposite of that and like, how can, yeah, how can you subvert those things on stage in a way that's honest lying? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know, okay, we're starting to get up on time, but I have one, a couple more questions for y'all. Um, how, uh, so, uh, so the listeners know we were kind of giggling about this and I wanted to ask it um, in sincerity or you can take it as you want. Um, those two clown teachers names, please. Oh, do you want to throw that in the chat, Jacqueline? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Um, is, uh, how has clown become a cishet white space? So, um, where was I? I was in... Blackwood territory. I was hanging out near Calgary and I had a friend of mine who introduced me to this other man, this um, older Cree man. And uh, she introduced me as a clown. He was like, oh, this is Barry, he's a clown. And his face just dropped and he just kind of stared at me and like really, really upset by that statement. 
And he's like, what do you mean? And I like laughed it off and I was like, oh, you know, like a, a performance clown, da, 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 da. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. Cause you don't, you're not supposed to talk about that because there is a clown society in the Cree way and in a lot of indigenous ways. Um, and it's, um, they're secret societies. They're part of ceremony. They have a whole bunch of rituals uh, and you have to be brought into them. And if you are into them, which I'm not, uh, you're not supposed to be speaking about it. And so that was just another realization, like how many times I was in the pachinko process and the, which is a tuck style of clown in Canada and people were just nipping at that, like, ooh, look at that juicy information over there. I just want it to bring it over to this bubble, this clown bubble. And that's when I just started to be like, oh, okay, that is Canadian clowning and Canadian is, you know, British and white and French. It's just like, that is this anchor and all these other disciplines are entirely different. So when we talk about clown, I'm not talking about, you know, Eastern philosophies or anything. It's European and the European um, effect on North America and North America has got a brutal history of white supremacy. So that's where I think it comes from. So what would yeah. you, actually, this is very fascinating to me. So what, so like when we're, when we're loosely saying clown, are we all on the same page or we're really talking about like the European lineage and the dominant art form of expression in terms of the clowning communities in the UK and North America? Well, I think, yeah, I, I do think so. And I think, um, you know, with clown being, um, you know, American uh, birthday clown and that whole, like we, we joked about clown conventions or something earlier in mm -hmm. private. And it was just like, you know, the, there's, there is a whole culture around that and there's yeah. sacred clowning and there's all these things. And I'm seeing companies detach themselves from the word clown, um, secretly pulling tenants of, you know, the clown rule book in order to, 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 to make their work, but starting to, to lean into different things, performer created, physical comedy, um, funny first, whatever. They're detaching from that monolithic idea of what a clown is, which might be good. I mean, especially if we're moving into a time where, you know, the fool or the clown from a European perspective doesn't translate to a globalized world in the same way. Um, then maybe it is a time to digest the clown concept, take what you need from it and leave the rest. I really appreciate that. Um, I also teach. And one of the things I feel that I'm like telling, really trying to encourage anybody is like, listen, like inside you as an artist, this is your opportunity to explore and learn. Take take what, you know, like discover in yourself your way. And then you decide what the canvas is. It doesn't have to be with the live audience. It could be storytelling. It could be painting. It could be poetry. Like you you get to decide and and you don't have to go into the same um, well-grouped paths that everyone else is. You can, you, you know, you can decide. Um, and so I love this, I, this, what you're naming here is that, that this is a time of maybe um, a, a transition or inflection point. Um, yeah, Jeff, something I try to emphasize when I teach as well is this notion that you don't actually need to be taught how to clown. Um, <laughs> you know, this notion of training, like obviously it can be very beneficial and useful, but a knowledge of, of clown, I think also just resides deeply in all of us. And so mm, training can help you remember those things or understand those things more fully about yourself. But the, the training lineages of, of the European, you know, quote unquote masters, as I think one of the ways clown has become very cis and hat and white, as well as the fact that mm, pretty much everything that's been written of, about clown has been written from that perspective um, with some more and more exceptions uh which is great but like i personally think clown has always been queer clown has always been a practice of the most oppressed and um you know when i was doing my thesis research i showed my supervisor a chapter from golier's book 
And her response was, what a fantasy of oppression this man has. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's true. <laughs> like it's, it's when you occupy those really privileged spaces, but you're really interested in exploring that really oppressed space because you know that's where the best comedy comes from um yeah mm -hmm. there's some real systematic harms being set up I think in that in that space yeah um I appreciate you naming that clown has always been queer because I know there's a whole school of some pedagogies here in the um in the state and I think if this comes out of the east coast and I've heard some teachers here say too is that the clown is prepubescent and I always am like, who makes up, like who made up this rule and who decided this? Um, yeah, so I, for me, like the question of how has clown become a cishet white space? Um, it, in some, it just, Barry, you seem inspired, go for it. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, you see, I saw the finger go oh. up. Oh, <laughs> yes. no, I just wanted to like highlight something Jacqueline said and put yeah. a big star around it because the Good idea work. of, um, of you know, Gaulier centering himself as the oppressed, like in the bigger picture, just how massively problematic it is to have people of, you know, mild inconvenience or, you know, their careers don't go quite as well as they wanted them to um, their big, their dreams that they thought they were going to get to aren't going to happen the same way they thought they would because of social changes, you know, whether it's different movements or anything like that. And then centering that as oppression um, is quite possibly how we got to this place of the low, the low man on the, on the, or the low rung on the ladder being the clown and that clown being a scruffy Irish dude or something like that. It's just like, that's, in a certain context, that makes sense and that's true. But maybe that's part of this bigger conversation. Once it starts to go global, there's a lot more things happening and that is, just needs a lot more nuance to it, a lot more thought around, um, you know, not thinking that you're the, the, the little person, the underdog trying to nip at the heels of oppression. It's, it's not yeah. the same for everybody. It's not the same for me as it is for my family, as it is for other people. And we don't want to get into the oppression of Olympics, but it, it can be quite problematic, especially if it's the basis of your teaching. Yeah, I really, that particular framing, I really appreciate too, that you're saying that like, perhaps at a moment it was true in that time, in that ecosystem. And it, in that, like, you know, where it was, it wasn't a global art form yet in that way, that particular teaching. But then as it went, that's where it, it, it um, what is our responsibility as teachers or practitioners in it to, to adjust, to make it more equitable? Um, which actually gets me like, what, what advice for there are people listening and uh, I'm imagining people are coming from many different disciplines, but what advice do you Barry and Jacqueline have for others um, to facilitate or to, to incorporate um, inclusion and diversity in clowning? We're all being polite. Oh. We're very, we're, this is a very, uh, yes. <laughs> you go ahead, Barry. Um, be honest. I know that it's like, it's the true, the, you know, the truth, but like, you know, if, if you really love European centered clowning and you believe that it's the most pure art form ever, just be honest with yourself that that's where you're at. You know, don't try and wish away that that's, problematic in certain ways or that that isn't going to fly with everybody just start there try and like just really understand okay what do I actually want instead of trying to jump to the next level of being right or politically correct about it or you know how do I smooth out the edges so I can still do essentially what I want but not getting shit for it it's like no like look at what you actually want to do on stage why you're saying those things and then be honest with yourself about it and then start to unpack it. Um, and the flip side of that is that I do think we do, I do feel we need safe spaces for people to explore those things. Um, whether it's agreements or conversations or you know, parameters that it starts getting into policies when we're having classes, 
um, that people are allowed to, to tackle issues that aren't easy to talk about in a safe space. And that we are in a process of making sure that when we then take that to the public, that people are given the tools to, to deconstruct that, not just as pump people full of clown rules, send them into the world and then watch them burn. Uh, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, yeah, I totally agree with needing affinity spaces because like these are difficult conversations and like we need to see where we, the beginning is like accepting where we are, like that naming, just being brutally honest with yourself. Like this is the one that I, this is what I love. And, and to also hold that like, your discomfort with holding the harm that it causes or et cetera, right? But just be, to be really honest with where we are. Um, what about you, Jacqueline? Yeah, I guess I would add to what the excellent things Barry has already said, this idea that clowns can do anything and mm -hmm. therefore they can have sexuality and they can have gender and they can fuck around with it. Um, and they can also create new spaces and new systems of being and teaching and sharing. And yeah, just, I think one of the things I love about clown is it's just reminded that everything in the world is literally made up. Language is made up, capitalism is made up. Everything we do, somebody made it up. And so we as clowns can use all the beautiful resources at our availability and our wild imaginations to make something else up. Yeah. Surprise Can I um, challenge you on one thing? Yeah. So I'm in LA and it's very woo woo hippie. Um, and so there is this idea of like, well, we can start over. And then from this point on, it's all good. But what happened in the past, you know, why give it attention and energy? We're starting in new. So do you, how do you, I, and I do, the, what you were naming is true, like language was created, it was made up, right? So how do we balance that? Um, what is our responsibility to hold the past and to know the sure. history? Yeah, great. So uh, a little example of this is in uh, the Pachenko style that I also did some training in. Um, there's a phrase uh, that you um, use to clear the body, which is to pass white light through the body. And there's been a lot of conversations about this phrase, white light, right? And so like a small tweak of language in that to not use that word and to invite a different, um, you know, prompt uh, can make a safe feel spacer for someone. And so I guess that's what I mean about we make it up. Like um, just because something's been taught a certain way, the, the way we teach it can change it. The language can evolve. Um, so yeah, definitely needs to have acknowledgement of what has happened and harms that have been done and then assume that moving forward things can be evolved and uh, yeah just you know mm. yeah mm, very just got, no i just got a lot more <laughs> just got a lot more um just because you know we real real philosophical i don't know how much time we have <laughs> but like we are just uh you know we can create it we can be it but ultimately societies cultures are the amalgamation of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of people adding and, and shifting things right As from an indigenous perspective one of the things we're constantly battling is the idea that like there's a big blank slate that happened 400 years ago in north america and poof a country evolved, right? Whereas like the United States is based off of Haudenosaunee women's teachings. The whole constitution is based off of indigenous teachings. The, the Pachinko clown process is rooted in awareness of indigenous teachings. And those teachings are connected to territory and that territory is a living thing. And that living thing is in danger of being forgotten about if we continue to detach from where these things come from which is maybe why I'm talking about like, if you want to hang on for dear life to a certain way of doing things, that part of it is just that discomfort of acknowledging all the things that come with it. And maybe there's a way to morph and move and change them the way languages shift and everything, that, like what you're saying, we have power to change it, but maybe not necessarily the power to 
rid it from our mind and start fresh. Like we're not all of a sudden taking all the same issues that happened yesterday with us. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you both for challenging my, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, overly, overly optimistic, uh, stance of we'll just make it all better. Um, I will, I will name here that for the idiot workshop, we've done a lot of work around the pedagogy and it's like really what I, what we just keep reminding ourselves is that, um, expand our time horizon and that we are going to mess up and we're gonna, we are gonna be learning all along the way. And, um, there are brilliant teachers and we like lean on the resources of others and in terms of the scholarship, um, beyond what we've been exposed to. So reading a lot, listening a lot. And just really, truly, like anyone is invested in clown and doing the work, it's like um, expand your time horizon and be willing to be uncomfortable and to stumble and to get up and try again. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, we're, it feels like it's a constant um, uh, space of iteration. Yeah, and clowns are good at failure, so. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Um, Y'all, we're at about uh, about 50 minutes, so I'm going to open it up to, uh, were there any other closing thoughts that just in like during the conversation that we had that you all want to um, address or name right now? It's in the past and it doesn't exist. It's in the past. It doesn't exist. You're right. Um, so I welcome the other practitioners now to come. Practitioners? Dear God, where am I? I, I welcome anyone else on the Zoom to, uh, to un- um, mute yourselves and to bring, come back on video if you'd like for the questions. Um, and John, do we have questions from folks? Um, <clears throat> don't have any questions in the chat yet. Um, feel free to write in the chat or to unmute yourself and speak. Okay, I, I, I'm going to throw a question in um, that really? may encourage others. It's a, it's a, maybe I'll just go on video, um, have other um, Clown Congress folks here as well. Oh, it's, it's nighttime here now. Um, so one of the things we've been, uh, came up today, especially on the Decolonization Anti-Racism Day was about discomfort. And I hear some of you talking about discomfort. Um, so. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the role of um, feeling uncomfortable and discomfort in, in your work, um, particularly rather than trying to speak to others and what we should do with our discomfort? So what, what is the role of discomfort in your clan work? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I mean, I had one experience um, in Guelph, Ontario, where it's a really long story, but the brunt of it is that I ended up walking into this church and there was someone who had just recently told me they were a newfound elder teaching all of these ceremonies to people. And there was an art installation as well. Uh, I'm not sure the merit of it, but they were handing out pieces of charred um, regalia, children's regalia in order to elicit a, an emotion from the uh, people in, the, in that space. And I just watched this whole room weeping out and having this, this very beautiful, cathartic experience with indigenous medicines and crying over the children that had been lost in residential school. And it pissed me off so bad like I had to, I had to just walk out of the space and another woman was in the same spot. She walked out, she had different reasons, but it just hit me like, <clears throat> you know, the violence that I endured, the, the everything growing up, the experiences of being displaced, of being afraid of social services, 
uh, not hearing about your family history until you're almost an adult. Um, all of that stuff was just sort of released from this group of people in a really kind, beautiful, gentle way that I know cousins who have passed that will never get that experience, relatives that have passed that will never have that experience. And so I don't really know. This isn't, this isn't trying to, I don't know if this actually helps, <laughs> but it's just trying to give some awareness as to what my experience was, was that it was, it's very difficult to um, worry about the discomfort um, because it's just more pressure on me to make something easy that hasn't been easy. Like getting here hasn't been easy. Um, despite how people see, you know, handouts to indigenous people or whatever other, you know, stereotypes come up. Um, so I don't know, like to start working through it, it can only get easier. If maybe it's painful in your lifetime, it'll be better in your kid's lifetime and hopefully better in your grandkids' lifetime that they won't have to go through the pain that you're resisting. Um, because if it just keeps going off, it's gonna blow up at some point. Yeah, there's definitely the pressure in the form of a clown and performance to make the audience comfortable. Um, do you, uh, Jacqueline, I'm curious on your thoughts and I, I, John, I have a quite follow up for this, um, but Jacqueline, go ahead. So what is the role of discomfort in your clown work? Yeah, I'm gonna speak to it as an audience member. Um, great. I, um, I've seen some really great clown shows lately um, that I think have played on that edge of like pushing the audience into discomfort and then inviting them to laugh and release that discomfort. Um, there's a wonderful show called Inner Elder by Michelle Thrush that does that very thing. Um, pokes a lot of fun at whiteness. Um, people are laughing. Uh, I'll just speak for myself. I was laughing in a place of like, <laughs> I'm uncomfortable, <laughs> but also you're funny and charming. Um, and so in some way, the clown was able to hold space for those, that duality of discomfort and um, enjoyment. Um, there's an incredible show um, right now in Canada, an adaptation of As You Like It, that does a very similar thing. Um, and so I think that my personal favorite experiences as an audience member are when clowns can get an audience to that place where we're uncomfortable, but also um, enjoying ourselves and back and forth between those emotions. Yeah, I think that's, for me, where like the quality clown lies, yeah. Um, I'm curious if either of you are familiar with Buffon as an mm -hmm. art form. Do you feel more called to do Buffon in terms of social justice and equity or conversations around identity? Do you feel like that? Oh, go for it. Me? Yeah, um, either one, we both had like, it both seemed <laughs> like you both had, yeah. Oh no, I thought I did. I, I, I heard about it, I learned about it on paper. It was like, oh my God, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's what I wanna do. And then I tried it and I sucked at it. <laughs> So it very quickly fell out of my uh, my skill set. <laughs> what about you, Jacqueline? Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about Buffon. Um, I there's a Canadian artist named Karen Hines who practices a style of Buffon that's called neo Buffon, and she studied with Goyer and then recognized the sort of fantasy of oppression that was inherent within that work. And so Neil Buffon, this approach that she um, created is really about looking at yourself and turning the critical eye onto your own um, things that need to be looked at. And so I'm a fan of that approach. Um, there's a fantastic, again, I'll reference Deanna Flesher. Her entire blog is wonderful. I assume she's gonna write a book someday. Um, and there's a great blog post on there called, Does the World Really Need Your Buffon Show? Um, because similarly, I think I see a lot of Buffon where the Buffon is ridiculing an audience that isn't really 
Um, the problem and also the Buffon has maybe not examined their own relationship to privilege and oppression. So yeah, Buffon is tricky. And also there's ableism um, latent within um, the classical forms of it and all kinds of different um, pieces. But I also, what I appreciate about how Deanna talks about Buffon and Clown is that they're not a binary, that they're just um, a spectrum the clown can live in. Um, and so I've been trying to explore it with my own clowning like, Buffon-esque, I would say, um, strategies and approaches, yeah. Yeah, I have a whole per theory, which I keep, John, he could probably chime in, that I'm like, I think that actually the clown, there was a bifurcation of clown, and at least in the European lineage, because like in the, even in like in, in Indian, like ancient, um, where they, you know, they say clown is universal and there are examples of it, but like that clowning wasn't so sweet and buoyant. And it was more like, like naming, like it was more call, it was, it was a diff, it was more like Buffon actually with clown in it. And there was mocking in there. And so um, I think that that's something for us is like, again, going back to this earlier idea. And I think Barry, you've said it and Jacqueline as well, which is like, you, um, if, if we're gonna change it, we, we have to acknowledge, like take in the pieces that resonate and um, go from there. And so I don't, by no means am I a, um, and I'm curious how you all feel like this. Do you feel like you're a pure clown? Like, would you identify as a clown and a pure clown? Pure? I don't know. If <laughs> I've done some shit. I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. What about you, Jacqueline? Yeah, I don't even know how to identify anymore. Um, yeah, clown-esque is a word I've been using a lot. I don't know if it's useful or not. But. Um, we have a comment from Hillary Ramson that says, um, circa clandestine insurgent clown um, army combined clown and Buffon to create a rebel clown. Cool. Yeah, I think at this whole conversation about clowning and um, social activism, I think the use using Buffon and there's um, clown me in. Um, Sabine Choquer talks about how when they're clowning um, that they actually as clowns, they bring in Buffon in their clown work when they're interacting because they're like clowning out in the streets. So I think that, that um, there's great examples of that. And I'll write down Sabine's name, Sabine of Clownian. And, and I think her last name is spelled like this. I could be wrong. Um, there is a question here um, let me see what this, thank you, Hillary. Um, um, I'm not, I don't know if this is a question that we could actually speak to, but the question is, are indigenous clowns able to speak to autistic audiences? So the, those autistic people feel the release of humor as humor and perception of meaning is different across neurotypes. So I think this is tricky to speak to because we're speaking of, about autistic people as a monolith and there's a wide range of neurodiversity. Um, and then the question of our indigenous clowns able to speak to autistic audiences. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what that, if we're asking, like, is there a particular type of clowning um, of, of indigenous, cultures that would speak more. So I'm gonna say Barry, since- you Yeah, yeah. I can, um, yeah. I mean, it's in generalities. I can just kind of point to some things that I've heard um, that, like I said, indigenous clown, I think is something that we need to, it, it's, it's sacred, it's not something that anyone can just access. Um, it's part of, a lot of protocols that people go through um, to be able to connect to it. So it's not really something that you'd see like on a stage near you ever. Um, but what I also have heard is that a lot of neurodivergent folks back in the day from elders have said um, they're typically treated with, because um, like every individual is assessed you know, there's like eight genders 
in the Cree worldview. And people are sort of allotted in different parts of ceremony, different parts of culture. And so people with um, you know, different abilities are often treated with very different um, skills and ceremonies and spiritual practices, uh, which would probably include clowning. That's about all I know. I am not a, I'm not a sacred practitioner and I don't have much more, but it is inspiring to know that, um, to see the world that way. Yeah. Um, do we have other questions from the group? No? Try I'm curious how the whole Congress is going. Yeah. Oh, here we go. What would a decolonized clown landscape look like? John, that's a huge question. <laughs> clown landscape is like the creepiest thought. <laughs> I just saw these like deformed clown skulls <laughs> bursting out of the hills and buttons everywhere. Buttons. <laughs> uh, just, just you mentioned that Barry about what's the clown congress doing and what how's it going. That's that's kind of my uh, question from today, particularly after two days. Like, what does it look like? We were working on um, today on on discomfort, particularly and um, retelling staging stories as clowns um, uh, events, real events that had a connection to colonial history. Um, but that are happening now for us now that we can read in our news now, you know, whether it's Royal family visiting, you know, Caribbean <laughs> islands and being faced with protests about reparations for slavery or, um, whatever. So, and we, we were looking at that, what the different kinds of discomfort. So as a white person, um, my discomfort is about, you know, my, my ancestors, um, that have, the legacy of colonialism and my privilege and that's my discomfort uh, a black performer is clowning um her discomfort is a different discomfort of course so but we were i don't know if we found some common ground about discomfort there that was interesting um we're also doing it in a place the venue is um uh ashton place called ashton court in bristol and it's uh i don't know the history of the building but it's one of those buildings you walk into and say Oh yeah, it's one of those buildings with the paintings of the, you know, the great and the good, um, and and it's awfully oppressive in a way. It's a wonderful space, but we here we are in that 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 sort of old colonial house. I, I'm I couldn't even guess the century it's built in. Um, it's kind of strange and and welcoming to be in a space that reminds us of that that the in in stone of that that history and the weight of that history. Um, so that's, that's how it's going. Um, and that's where those comments about discomfort, um, and, and the decolonized landscape or the decolonized clown community or communities, or what does it look like? And of course it's going to be different from who we are and what community we're working in, but I'm curious what it might feel like, or if it's possible, or is that just another idealistic, let's make it all up again. thoughts on this. Can't go for it. I've talked a lot. <laughs> no, I think it's really complicated because it's, we're talking about entertainment. Like, it's like so many people do, like, it's just like, what is the real, like, what, what decolonized clown? Does that mean we separated out also out from like capitalism and entertainment, which is to put up a show to entertain people, to amuse them, to make money. Um, like, I don't know. I'm also in Los Angeles where, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't, there, there was a way that I think I had, and this is like where I'm like, gosh, it's just constantly like falling into holes of like being, just accepting I know, I don't know. Um, it's like, I thought I had an idea of what would decolonize clown look like. And I thought it was like maybe a year ago, John early on, I was like, oh, it's about like, the history, like getting, pr pulling forward the real history and letting that inform a new pedagogy. And now I'm like, yeah, but then we're still operating in the same system. 
So now I, I don't know what it looks like. Um, sorry, maybe check in with me in a year and then I'll have an idea. Jacqueline, Barry? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's all bullshit, right? But like uh, the <laughs> idea that, um, I, what I found a lot of comfort in is realizing just how ubiquitous the issue is. You know, like when we look at just decolonizing clown, okay, what is the history of colonization within clown, like particular teachers and et cetera. You start to look at the world that they came from and then that blows up and you see all these other socioeconomic things that happen and then that and then that and then that. Eventually you follow it back far enough. You can either absolve yourself or, you know, sit in a pit of despair that I can't believe that those ancestors did that. What I find is by like accepting that that is the case and then trying to move forward with that, there is a lot of strength, you know, understanding that, you know, European style clowning benefited from a renaissance that benefited from the extraction of resources from colonies. It, it's from the earth. It, it's, it's riches that came from the earth that wasn't there, that wasn't theirs. Um, how do you give back? How do you cycle through that process? How do you make this thing grow through a destructive phase and come back to a more of a healing phase if you can encompass the entire history rather than just cherry pick a couple points in it? And so I think it is about just constantly assessing is what I'm doing doing more good uh, than harm? And am I, you know, am I doing... Am I digging deep enough into some of the things that I want to talk about? Um, is it for a cheap laugh? Is it for a few bucks? Or am I like really committed? And I, I think that you know we're going to progress anyways. So more people being in interested in decolonizing, you have as good an idea what it looks like as I do, if not, you know, more from your own experiences. So I don't know. This is all moving forward with it. I think for me, one of the biggest challenges that comes up when I think about this question is having to let go of our fear of scarcity. You know, as clowns, we occupy this very niche world where we're already like, oh, how do I get funding for my clown show? Or how do I, you know, do my, my weird clown art that is not very mainstream in general? And I think whenever we are in these small communities, we... I feel sometimes like there's a scarcity of resources or a scarcity of opportunity. And then the fear is that like, there won't be enough for everyone. And of course there will be enough for everyone. Um, yeah. So for me, like leaning into a feeling of abundance. Um, and I know that sounds really woo. Maybe I should move to LA, but <laughs> just this, this feeling of like, um, Mm, more more opportunities for equity, diversity, inclusion, and clown begets more good clown, um, begets more a richness and a diversity of our community and um, uh, a challenging of perspectives. And yeah, but it's uh, it looks, I don't know what it looks like, but my impulse is that it's going to feel better. Looking for a feeling. Yeah, and I, I want to, like, I hear you on, like, LA and woo, like, not to say, <laughs> I think that they're, 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 like, to hold, like, I take this to my own faith tradition of Sikhism, Chardikala, which is undying optimism, and in the West, we kind of, people think about it just being very positive, but actually what it's saying is, how do you hold, how do you, how do you, in the deepest of darkness, hold the light? How do you hold it? And so it's actually a calling, not a that it's, po it's not saying it's possible. It's actually saying it's a very difficult thing. And that reminds me of, um, and I'm gonna put the quote in here. It's from Braiding Sweetgrass and, um, and um, Robin Kimmerer, I'm mispronouncing their name, is not everything should be convenient. And going back to this idea of like, and so this is why sometimes woo woo culture is like, it's actually saying, don't be uncomfortable. Oh, if it's uncomfortable, like, just get yourself out of that discomfort or, you know, like there is not a lot of like reflection on account of like, 
why have we made discomfort bad? Like if all feelings are neutral, if they're just lights on like a dashboard, like your car, they're just telling you things. Why have we made anger bad? Why have we made, you know what I'm saying? And so these gets into socialized ways of, um, of, of, of the way that we've built our civilizations. Um, can I read that quote from, we had a real estate problem, John? Cause I think this might be a nice one for, for folks as they're thinking about decolonizing and pedagogy, et cetera. So this is um, from a book called, we had a little real estate pro problem. I'm gonna read from you about Will um, Rogers who is a, was a pretty influential um, uh, performer and satirist. Um, and this is in from the, like the 1920s. Um, so at a time when the population of the United States was 120 million, Rogers was averaging 40 million readers every day. There had never been a Native American personality so influential among the white population. He held serious sway and his influence was disturbing to his literary colleague, H.L. Mencken. He alters foreign policies. He makes and unmakes candidates. Millions of Americans read his words daily and those who are unable to read listen to him over the radio. I consider him the most dangerous writer alive today. To which um, Rogers responded, come on now, Henry, you know that nobody with any sense ever took any of my gags seriously. They are taken seriously by nobody except halfwits. In other words, 85% of the voting population. And Will Rogers was the Cherokee, um, was of the Cherokee tribe and he was even invited to the White House and he um, didn't refuse to go. And so it, he, it, it, that to me, I, I'd name Will Rogers as an example because like if in the US, for anyone in the US, and I'm sure this probably is relevant for the UK in terms of looking at like Harvard Lampoon or McSweeney's or The Onion, it's a history of white men. And there have been political serotists that have shaped the way that we are writing and making comedy in that way that no one even acknowledges. And so here's just one example um, that I think it's really important for us to look at our, to, to really do your own research and to, wait, that sounds conspiracy theorist. Take that back. To just <laughs> do, um, <laughs> take that back. To just read about the history of other people and to not, to not assume that it's just, um, that it was just made by that one identity. Can I just add on to that, that it's going back to something that some of you were speaking about earlier that, that caught my ear, the, <laughs> the myth I've, I've noted, I don't know if anyone used this word, the mythology of the, of the clown, as in the European lineage of the clown that had been sort of resuscitated or reinvented, you know, post second world war, France and so on. Um, so that mythology of that power of that clown, um, being kind of fairly useless, you know, when it's transposed into another time and place, particularly, um, which, which is your case, you know, my case, it's the same place, but it's another time. So, so what, if, what do we do if we, if we kind of, you know, throw that one out, that particular version. And, and then there's the, you know, the whole thing, the, the clown is this English word that, you know, other European nations adopted when they had the perfectly good word themselves, you know, for all mm. sorts of socioeconomic reasons. Um, so what have we got left? We don't even, you know, maybe it's better not to have a word we're trying to, you know, universalize in, in, in our globalized situation. So what have we got left? What have we got, what's our common ground with, with diversity. So that I'm trying to paint a picture of the decolonized clown here, um, which may have another name or, um, so, so yeah, what do we, do we just stop talking about this stuff and just talk about what we actually do, which is what you folks have been talking about. Um, yeah, that's a slightly rambling response to some of the things we've talked about wondering what to do next. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Like to your question of like, you know, letting go of some of the old narratives. For me, there's been use in looking for other examples. Like, and Rita, you know, looking at Will Rogers. When I was doing my 
research for my thesis looking at like Josephine Baker as an example of someone who used a lot of clown strategies um, in her work and looking at other female clowns because that's an, not very talked about history. Like I think there's benefit to going, oh, maybe they haven't been identified as clown, pure clown, whatever that means. Um, but that there's benefit to looking back through history and rewriting some of those narratives um, to include a more diverse um, acknowledgement of the fact that comedic strategies that emerged during vaudeville were heavily influenced by African-American performers and like really looking for where a lot of those comedic strategies and clown strategies came from. Um, yeah, to me, there's benefit for that because then we have a fuller picture of what we do and why we do it, mm, good and bad. Yeah, and I think too, like to name that where we are in time right now is like we are, we are in it. So it's, it's like, it's kind of like, um, it might feel like for people who are like in trying to do this work, it's like, it feels like you're like walking in circles, you know, but like, just know that, like, just look out the window, because it's actually a cylinder tower, and the view is changing, but it's going to feel the same. And it is, there is an element of like circling, and walking around these, this thing and coming back, and it's important. So asking the same questions and, um, I think that that's really important for us to hold as we ask this bigger question of like, what does decolonized clown look like? Um, yeah. I think um, as silly, um, but it's like, I mean, it's all relationships, right? Like we're talking about how do we make a healthier world where people are included, where people aren't being traumatized and, and destroyed. Um, Oh, this is so dumb. This is so dumb. So my uh, my analogy is like when your relationship is kind of having some issues, right? Do you like break down and think about what, what's wrong with you and try and like map out every little thing that you've ever done right and every little thing that you've ever done wrong and come to a conclusion about who you want to be? Or do you do the dishes and stop messing around? <laughs> you know, like you just like deal with the things that are happening first. Make indigenous friends have more programming and money spent towards um, different people of color, give people uh, leadership platforms uh, that aren't centered solely around the conversation of diversity, but are within your own organization, have different ethnicities on your board of directors, um, go to other people's stuff and, you know, stop trying to be the answer to the world's problems and just like, hone in on what you can do. I feel like those are tangible things that can help decolonize uh, rather than slip into a pit of despair because we're terrible, terrible, terrible people. Because we all are. <laughs> so. Oh, Gary, let them feel a little terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that, like, calling, like, it's action, too. We can't just sit there and, like, analyze. It's taking action. It really is. That's, a, that's like, a big thing to underline. Anyone who's still listening, action, action, action. Yeah. For me, that's yeah. the allyship, yeah, what you just described there, Barry. So, yeah. yeah. Um, John, I think we are right at time now. That's that's right, we are. Um, shall we close, folks? Um, if anyone would like to come on video, uh, maybe just we can all go around and share a word, if they'd like, um, of just a, a closing thought or how you're feeling in the moment. Um, we get, okay, you can throw it in the chat as well. And so, uh, John, do you like to start us off? And then we'll throw it to um, Barry, Jacqueline, and folks in, um, in the room. Okay, I, I'm feeling really grateful that, um, that you, you took this idea that we came up with and, and just made it happen. Thank you so much, really grateful. Oh, me? Um, yeah. no, great. I'm grateful to meet y'all and see Jacqueline. Um, and you know, every time it, it's, it's, it's exciting. I, I never feel like I have it figured out. I just talk through it and it's, it's more fun, fun to do it on a piece. So <laughs> thank you. My word is grateful as well. Um, I've been on 
a couple panels recently where these questions haven't been held in the greatest way. And so I really appreciate Amrita, uh, your work to hold space and really shape the conversation in a really specific and deliberate way. Thank you for that. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm feeling uh, grateful and um, inspired by what both you, Barry and Jacqueline have shared. I, I'm excited to go and yeah, I'm excited. Ronnie, since you're the one on video, if you'd like to share. Eye opening, partially, and thank you. Beautiful. Um, all right, I will take that as a cue since other folks aren't on video and I don't see anyone else unmuted, that, um, that we are closing out and just uh, grateful again for the time and space and the resources that have been dedicated to make this conversation possible and also to honor and to uh, gratitude for the people creating the time and space to listen to this conversation. And um, we hope that it inspires you to take action and to make some changes in your, um, in your part of the world. Um, John, anything you want to plug about the weekend before we all say farewell? Oh, the was well, the 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 congress. You mean the week? Um, yes, the yeah. so, I mean, it's uh, not the weekend. Yeah, just if you it's happen easy. to be in reach of coming to Bristol in the UK, uh, we have two more days left, and tomorrow we're um, exploring climate and the planet. So we're getting kind of big into the bigger stuff. Um, and what's the clown response to that? What do we do? And what's it all about? And then uh, if you want to come just on the last day, on Thursday, um, we'll be wrapping it up and coming up with our recommendations to the UN. I think that's part of it, isn't it? Um, or something like that. I don't know if we'll come up with a, you know, a policy statement. That sounds awful at the end of it. But what a Congress is for, if not to influence policy, influence how we decide what to do, maybe. So please do, do come along or just check out on social media, Clown Congress um, and what we're doing. You can see bits of video and photos that are getting posted up there. All right, Esther. And thanks to all the thanks and beautiful. comments in the chat. Um, there well, the thank end. you. Yes, thank you well. Have a beautiful rest of your evening, um, wherever you are gathered or day, if you're all the way on the West Coast of North America. All right. Ciao, everyone. Bye, Thank everybody. You.